introduce the panel. So on my far right, uh, we're very honored to um, have with us Deputy Governor Sarah Alade, who is the Deputy Governor uh, for Economic Policy uh, at the Central Bank uh, of Nigeria and former Acting Governor. To my immediate uh, right is Terry Wadio, who is uh, the Deputy Governor of Bank Indonesia. Uh, to my left is Dong He, who is uh, Deputy Director of Monetary and Capital Markets at Barclays at the International Monetary Fund. He's been very busy this morning launching their Global Financial Stability Report. Uh, to his left is Phyllis Papa David, who's a team leader for, oh, sorry, uh, you, you swap places, my mistake. So <laughs> believe that's not Phyllis, that's Daniel Hanna, who's the Global Head of Public Sector and Development Organizations at Standard Chartered. And then on, on Daniel's left is Phyllis Papa David who's team leader for international macroeconomics at the ODI. Right, so let me kick things off. I'm going to open by asking uh, our panelists a few uh, questions um, and allow them to at least uh, frame how they see the issues we're discussing uh, today, which are obviously complex and extremely important ones and very relevant uh, for the annual meetings. Um, we'll have plenty of time for your questions later on, and also if you're watching online, you can, apparently I'm not quite sure how this works, but you can actually communicate a question to me via this iPad in front of me and it will appear and I can then channel it to the appropriate person. Um, so uh, do, do do that if you're uh, watching online. Um, uh, Deputy Governor Aladi, if I could start with you. Um, let's, let's start generally. What would you say are the most uh, critical uh, challenges currently facing Nigeria when it comes to managing financial shocks? Thank you very much. I mean, it's hard to thank the organizers for inviting me. The financial shocks we have uh, you know, originated mainly from the low prices of, the com of commodities. And uh, Nigeria being an oil dependent com country, the government owns over 80% of its revenue from oil. Once oil is challenged, then the revenue, uh, the income for the economy is also uh, in trouble. In addition to that, we also have uh, production. The production of oil was also affected. We were not producing as much as we used to. So those were basically the, the sources, the low revenue. The currency also uh, had uh, issues. Once revenue becomes a uh, uh, decline, you have uh, the um, reserves of the economy decline, the currency volatility, there was a problem on the currency side, and we had to do a lot to be able to manage uh, currency. So the volatility in exchange rates, the declining reserves led to uh, deficits. We had trend deficits, fiscal deficits, as well as uh, current account deficits. So the problem, or in the last uh, two quarters, we have also, that's the first quarter as well as the second quarter, we have also seen growth contracting in the economy and inflation is rising. Inflation rose almost uh, twice what it was. As at December, we had 9.5. By August, it was already 17.6. So the challenge for uh, the economy is how to stimulate growth without necessarily losing and uh, that is where we are, trying to balance the control of inflation and also more stable growth. Can you talk a little bit about the measures then you are uh, taking to, uh, to, to, to counter the forces that you're grappling with currently? Yeah. What we have done recently was to, for central banks to look at inflation because uh, inflation hurts growth as well. If inflation uh, continues the way it is, we, we were going to get into serious trouble. So we decided to address inflation as well as also uh, use the same instruments to be able to uh, encourage investors to bring in foreign exchange. So we raise rates. But um, when you raise rates, you know that growth is further depressed because then there's no uh, you know, manufacturers and all the growth stimulating agencies because of the high rate of interest not uh, run. But we decided to do that at the at the moment so that once we begin to have the foreign exchange inflow, investors begin to have confidence in the economy and inflation is tame, then growth, we can then focus on growth. But we're also looking at diversification of the economy away from oil. And that is one important uh, step that the government 
government as well as central bank is uh, taking to support the economy. Once we are able to diversify away from this unwholesome dependence on one product, the economy will be good. And we are achieving some things. I was just sharing with someone that uh, by the year 2018, about one third of imports, which today is um, uh, refined petroleum, will be stopped. We'll have been able to refine our own product, our own petroleum in the economy, and that will automatically save us some a third of the foreign uh, exchange value fees of imports now. Thank you very much. That's a very clear summary. Um, Deputy Governor, Governor Wajio, could you talk a little bit about what you think emerging and developing markets can need to change, in a sense, so they better handle these shocks that can hit them? Uh, thank you, Sam. Uh, let me start uh, thanking uh, the organizer for inviting me to speak uh, on this uh, conference. Uh, yes, I think uh, emerging market lifting can be uh, fairly open and global uh, economy and uh, volatility is uh, the new uh, of the day. Uh, in most cases in Oprah, East Asia, I think we are quite resilient in withstanding this uh, you know, uh, global uh, volatility. Uh, what we need to do and what we have been doing so far in Asia, including in Indonesia, I think there's only three key measures is important how EM uh, emerging market can withstand uh, better in uh, you know uh, 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 receiving the, the global uh, uh, financial shocks. First, getting the fundamental and sound macroeconomic right, ready to stand macroeconomic adjustment. This is what we have been doing in Indonesia from the very paper tantrum 2013 and 2014 putting stability on a good policy. After that, then 2015 and now we are, uh, after stability are being intact, then we can switch to growth over stability. So getting the fundamental right, macroeconomic adjustment is very important. Fiscal policy, monetary policy, and structural reform. But then, under the global financial shocks with this rate of growth, this is not right. Not only that we, it is not enough to uh, withstand this aspect. Necessary, but not sufficient. What we need to, uh, to be doing on the uh, second aspect. This is what we practice in Indonesia on the central bank policy. In the past, central bank usually only rely on interest rate policy. But when we are cooperative with volatile capital flows, it's not enough. We need to implement what we call it monetary and macro prudential policy mix. This is what we practice since 20 uh, time. Yes, we implement the interest rate policy, but we also implement greater exchange rate flexibility. Beyond that, we also implement what we call it the macro prudential policy. Macro prudential in both how to uh, minimize the volatile capital flows as well as to reinforce the transmission and the bank lending. By doing the, this policy mix, interest rate policy, greater exchange rate flexibility, capital flows management, as well as macro potential, I think we can better withstand the global shock without having greater impact on economic growth. Stability can be achieved, but growth, uh, you know, uh, negative growth to, uh, uh, negative uh, impact to growth can be minimized. This is the second uh, menu that we implement. The third menu that we implement in Indonesia is putting in place financial system stability prevention and resolution. We just passed this year a law that we already practicing so far over the past two years how the two coordinate between Ministry of Finance, Central Bank, uh, FSK, Financial Service Authority, and also Deposit Insurance for financial stability prevention and resources. We meet every quarter. We uh, assessing what the risk of financial stability and coordinate the policy, not only from the central bank, but also from the uh, financial service authority uh, as well as the, 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 the fiscal policy. And including on this aspect, how we need to implement the new uh, you know, uh, 
uh, policy on the Basel uh, Ten Principle, uh, as high be uh, you know uh, resolution recovery plan, as well as how to uh, have a crisis resolution mechanism in place. Beyond that, I think adequacy of foreign intervention is also important. How a country can better withstand global financial shock. I think these three measures that we implement since 2013 and up to now, I think work quite well. I think our country has been weathering well since 2013 when uh, 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 you know, uh, table tender 2014 and since 2015 we, 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 we can boost our economic growth. I think this year we expect Indonesia expect economic growth will be rebound five uh, percent this year. Next year 5.2 percent. Inflation is quite low. This year 3.2 percent. Next year 3.6 percent. Current contingency is under uh, you know uh, control about 2.5 to 3 percent. I think uh, I think those 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 issues that I think thanks to the three three. Uh, Report of the I, IMF um, biannual report. What do you now, looking ahead for the next six months or twelve months, see as the, the most important potential shocks or risks that emerging markets need to be thinking about when they set their policies, as the two de deputy governors have been outlining for us? some firming of commodity prices as compared to uh, six months ago, so there is some arm race going on. But prospects across the, the year to be seen as emerging market and developing countries uh, differ sharply across uh, the regions and countries, uh, with emerging Asia uh, and the Indian in particular uh, showing robust growth. Uh, but sub sub Saharan Africa uh, experiencing a pretty sharp slowdown. So that's in terms of economic prospects. In terms of uh, financial stability, uh, you know, people have been concerned about the leverage in emerging markets um, uh, broadly. Uh, here, uh, actually, we see some positive developments. We feel that the leverage in many emerging markets uh, actually appear to have peaked or are peaking uh, as lower commodity prices uh, have reduced the need for great capital investment. And so that's, uh, that's on the positive side. So after seven years, you know, since the financial crisis, for the first time, early indications, early indications suggest that corporate leverage uh, is poised to fall for the first time. Perhaps with the exception of China. Uh, having said that, we feel that corporate leverage remains high, uh, and uh, and uh, is a baseline can take a long time uh, for for an ultimate delivery to, to take place, and uh, uh, so leverage.
Let me just jump back quickly on, on risk, specific risk. So how are you assessing political, a couple I'd like to ask about. One would be political risk. Um, the, the US elections, the obvious one, uh, based on that. Is that a, a concern for, for markets and emerging markets? And second of all, uh, the Federal Reserve has been a, a, a consistent source of uh, concern for some people. Very much. Let me turn to, to Daniel then. Um, if we think about uh, the work you're doing around the world, in Asia, uh, Africa, Middle East, and so on, um, what do you see in terms of best practices in, in, at, for by countries when it comes to preparing themselves for potential shocks in markets? Uh, thanks, Sam. And, um, let me also extend my thanks to the organisers of this excellent platform. And thank you to my uh, fellow speakers for all making excellent points. Um, as you said, Standard Chartered, uh, we are very much focused on our markets across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. We're on the ground in 74 different countries, and uh, we make 90% of our sort of profits and revenues in, in dealing with those markets. Um, and my team focuses very much on talking to official institutions, central banks, multilaterals, uh, ministries of finance, and also uh, development organizations around a lot of these issues. I think before I sort of pick on a couple of themes, I think let me touch on this point around what we're talking about, which is in terms of shocks. Because actually, by some measures, uh, if you look at sort of traditional indicators of volatility, which is often seen as a bad thing, those things are actually relatively low. So people often look at things like the VIX uh, index or a global bond yield. And if you just take a snapshot of those, things look pretty calm. But actually, it is the volatility of this volatility that is being called shock, unexpected, that is really, I think, causing a lot of uh, concern and issues about how you manage it. Um, we've spoken a lot about the financial, but let me just also mention a couple of others, one of which has been the pandemic. Um, we've done a lot of work around Ebola, for example, in West Africa, where we were very heavily involved with development organizations about the response there. That had tremendous social, economic, and obviously political implications. The other one, obviously, is around climate. And we're seeing in Southern Africa, where it is disastrous at the moment, a very severe drought, but it's also had extensive implications. So I think do need to sort of broaden that impact around and uh, not just focusing on the financial markets. But let me answer your question. I, I, I see sort of broadly three themes, and I think both the deputy governors have kind of touched on some of this already. Um, the first was we have seen emerging markets broadly improve resilience. Um, so if you look at the amount of FX reserves that countries have been holding over the last couple of decades, they have substantially gone up. If you look at the number of sovereign wealth funds or stability funds or other sorts of rainy day funds, if you like, that have been set up, you've also seen a lot of that. There's been really good best practice then in emerging markets around them. And we've also seen countries develop uh, bilateral and multilateral swap lines that have 
each other to try and build shock absorbers so that one country isn't trying to face in the market on its own. Um, and I think another key point that I'm sure both Deputy Alex will talk about later as well is the development of local currency capital markets, trying to, um, uh, what's often called the original sin of emerging markets, trying to remove the reliance on foreign currencies on the dollar and try and really develop an indigenous, indigenous sorry, um, power. I think that's very important. And we've seen a lot of great work around that, so improving resilience. The second one is preparedness. Uh, and um, Deputy Governor uh, Kerry actually sort of mentioned quite a lot of that, about the work that um, Indonesia has done, for example, on, on trying to control capital inflows and outflows in terms of setting up protocols between the central bank and the Ministry of Finance on how to deal with particular crises. Um, I think more broadly, we've seen a much more dynamic um, debt management policy being engaged by many countries, looking at when to raise debt, how to raise it, when to hedge, whether it's domestic, foreign, or tenor. Um, and equally, we've seen a sort of more flexible exchange rate policy broadly adopted in a lot of countries. And again, the exchange rate tends to be a very useful uh, shock absorber when a country gets hit uh, by an unexpected shock. The third theme, which I think is, is very important uh, and uh, often sort of overlooked, is actually communication. Uh, I think we've seen a really big step up from emerging markets in communicating between stakeholders, whether that's the international investment community and sort of engaging in non-deal ratios and coming to the market and explaining the situation, explaining the context, uh, whether it's engaging in rating agencies, which is something we do a lot of work with, or the multilateral organizations, and, and really trying to articulate the sort of medium-term plan, as well as kind of aggregating relief for shock. Our experience broadly has been that markets tend to actually react um, often negatively when a shock happens, but if they can see how a country is trying to navigate out of it, and they think that the plans are credible, actually they feel a lot of comfort and confidence uh, and so I think this ongoing communication about the situation and doing it on an incredibly frequent basis is very important. And it's something that I think both the Nigerians and the Indonesians have done some great best practice around and probably talk about a little bit later. Thanks. Finally, uh, Phyllis, let me ask you, uh, can, we, can we talk specifically about the IMF uh, and particularly what um, IMF uh, best practice is here in terms of helping emerging markets deal with these uh, shocks when things do go wrong? Um, do you think that um, the IMF has the right approach uh, to dealing with um, dealing with situations in emerging markets? What what would your advice be? And um, also maybe following on from Daniel's uh, response, it'd be helpful to get your sense also of what best practices you're seeing in emerging markets at the moment when it comes to preparing for unexpected uh, events. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sam. And it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I guess I would start by framing this with uh, a statistic, uh, which was touched upon briefly. Um, there's about $13 trillion of, of debt at the moment trading at a negative interest rate. So a statistic was mentioned in relation to that, and some debt statistics are topping out. But when you have that sort of uh, amount of debt trading at a negative interest rate, it might be abstract to some people, but it's actually a financial distortion. And those types of financial distortions can cause sudden shifts in asset prices, even if we see uh, an increase in interest rates in the United States, for example, that is expected, and it gets priced in and priced out of the markets. These types of bubbles or distortions do cause sudden shifts in asset prices. And the problem is that there's a number of countries where Clearly, the countries that run into problems either don't have the institutional capacity or the resources to deal with those shocks. So every shock is different, every financial crisis is different, but there's a lack of institutional capacity in some of these economies where, at least from a currency perspective, there's something to be said for the usage of, of financial deepening, of new financial instruments to target that volatility and in doing so, limiting the severity of the crises. So I think perhaps, maybe Dong is better placed than me to comment on the, on the IMF specifically, but I think there is something to be said for leaning towards financial deepening and the usage of alternative instruments and not simply just stabilizing the situation once a crisis hits those most vulnerable countries. Could you talk a little bit about specifics? Where, where are you seeing uh, best practice in terms of individual countries? Where, where would you um, draw attention to? Well, I think countries um, in Southeast Asia, you know, in the aftermath of the 
Southeast Asian crisis. There were a number of economies that um, were very successful in rebuilding their reserves through lowering their exchange rates or various other policies depending on the country. Well, how, how has the IMF spending changed on this then over, the, over recent years when it comes to advising uh, emerging markets? How do you deal with this stuff and also when it actually maybe it may get into a, a, a difficult situation? So it's, um, on this one, issues, uh, but of course underlying uh, that, we need very deep uh, and, uh, and uh, sophisticated financial markets. And that calls for many years of efforts. Um, it's not only that we need to have a sound macro economic framework, we also have to have a sound financial structure, and that takes a lot of effort from the financial central authorities. Uh, but specifically for the fund, I think um, reflecting changing uh, global governing structure uh, in the sense that emerging markets and developing countries have been the main contributor to global growth uh, uh, in the past couple of decades, uh, and they will continue to do so in the future. So I think the governing structure of the fund has been evolving to reflect the growing role of, of uh, uh, emerging markets. Uh, and, um, and in terms of its financing, Sorry, I, just to build on this point around new financial instruments and the role of the emerging markets, I, I think one, one of the very interesting things that I think has happened over the last couple of years is when a shock happens, and, and basically for a country, sometimes you want to lose market access or market access becomes very expensive. I, I think what we've started to see the multinationals do is start to think creatively about how they can provide some guarantees or halo effects to give those countries market access. So I'll give you an example. Last year, we worked with Ghana, um, and uh, at the time, they were going through an adjustment, they were in an IMF program, or just about to go into an IMF program, and the World Bank through IDA provided a 40% guarantee, which enabled uh, Ghana to go and activate the Eurobond to raise a lot of funding. Now, this has a number of implications, not least the fact that by the World Bank being involved, it provides a halo to other investors that says, actually, your perception of risk may not be accurate, actually, it may be less risky, um, and it encourages or crowds in further investment capital and helps the country through this period of, of volatility or shocks. And I, and I think we've seen these sort of uh, guarantees used by the multinational actors increasingly, and I think that's going to become quite a powerful tool in an arsenal about how helping a country deal with a, a sudden shock uh, when they have a plan to get through it to just get them through over that sort of initial uh, turbulent period. Thanks very much. Uh, Dr. Alade, could I uh, turn to you and, and the issue of currency policy? Uh, Earlier this year, obviously Nigeria did move to a more flexible exchange rate policy. It isn't. It's still held back from a fully floating uh, exchange rate policy. Could you explain the evolution of your thinking um, when it comes to uh, currency policy right now, and, and particularly what is what is the country going to do looking forward in terms of starting to think about rebuilding uh, reserves that have been heavily depleted? It's, uh, it's still a managed yield, and uh, 
we have, we are beginning to see uh, improve, not at the, the rates, I mean, we still, we believe that it could be better, but we're beginning to see the inflows after the uh, adjustment in the exchange rate. But as I said earlier, the, the, in order to be able to reduce the reserves which had declined, uh, we need to diversify the economy. Right now, we depend only on oil, and we know that oil is challenged. The price is low, the production for Nigeria is also low, and as long as oil is the only commodity that we depend on, then rebuilding reserves is going to be difficult. So the government has a plan, has a plan which we have started, of diversifying the economy, of um, you know, reducing imports. Whatever we can produce internally, we want to produce it so that we can save money uh, importing them. I just gave the example of the refinery. We have, uh, we produce oil, we export crude, and we also import refined oil. So we want to stop importing refined oil. And in another year or two, about 30% uh, of the foreign exchange that is spent on refined oil will stop. We've also done a lot in terms of uh, some of the food produce. Rice, for instance, we spend substantial amount importing rice which we can grow. Anything that can grow in the economy, we want to grow. We want to produce it so that we are not spending uh, money on it. And those are the kind of things that we have put in place. We are also trying to encourage foreign direct investors to come in and that those things that we import from countries we want them to set it up and then be able to do that for us. How, how important uh, is it that Nigeria obtains uh, help from the IFIs uh, we are already talking to uh, to some of the multilateral institutions to, to get some loan for development, and um, and I'm sure that will come through very soon. The, the perception is that you need to go further on the reforms, though, that the government hasn't gone far enough, and that's led to a stalling of these discussions. We haven't stopped reforming. We are still, we look at, uh, we put in place some measures, policies, and we continue to fine tune. Also, well, what, what experiences and um, can you offer in terms of how Indonesia has handled uh, exchange rate volatility in recent years? What, what, what have you learned from these experiences which has allowed you to navigate this? And a, a specific question uh, looking ahead like, for the rest of this year, we do have this question about whether we could once again face a tightening by the Federal Reserve. Um, do you think that this is something that could cause further volatility in growth um, currency markets in particular? Um, or do you think this is not something that's unexpected and therefore emerging markets should be able to handle? Uh, Indonesia already, uh, you know, practicing uh, exchange rate uh, uh, flexibility. Uh, the biggest test that we had was during the tax cut on um, between May 2013 to somewhere about August 2013 when everybody was shocked and want to get out of that's the test of our exchange rate flexibility. Uh, but I think we managed quite, quite well. As I said, giving the fundamental right, communication to the markets, as well as sending the signal of the policy, I think is very uh, important. And financial market deepening is also very important. I think uh, we start uh, also uh, Accelerating our reform on both FX and money market. Uh, getting the price right, we introduced the new what is Jakarta Interbank Spot Dollar Operator, also Daigo. The pricing, I think, uh, is very important. Signaling. Uh, second, uh, we also introduced the market conduct of both FX and money market. Third, we introduced new instrument and swap, you know, forward, uh, you know, cross currency swap and so on. And the money market we introduce a repo using government bond uh, at the market. I think I think I think this uh, we already succeeded uh, on this aspect. Now we started to develop more uh, infrastructure uh, using CCP. I think this is also important. I think this is the experience that we uh, run through the uh, greater exchange rate flexibility and the size of the 
the market and affects market knowledge. Data rates are is around, used to be only 2 billion US dollar per day. Now it's close to 5 to 6 billion US. But the market are uh, market mechanisms working quite quite well. But I have to talk so. What do you mean by little exchange rate flexibility? Little exchange rate flexibility is not purely put let the market determine the money market. I do not think that nowhere in the emerging market can let the market just determine by SI. We use the term what we call it, our exchange rate policy characterized by stabilizing over the fundamental. As long as the market mechanism works along the fundamental, the misalignment is not too wide. We just let the market determine. But if there is huge shocks, the central bank stand ready to stabilize the market, both symmetrically under the huge inflow of outflow by intervening in the market as well as buying government bonds from the secondary market. We have a very good database of foreign investors that holding our assets. We characterize them between the real money, long-term money, and short-term hedge fund money. The real money, the long-term money, we know everybody is buying our government bonds. They are want to have a stability of the exchange rate over the longer term. They do not like the riding the wave. But the short term hedge fund, they are the one that like to, you know, riding the wave. So this is also, uh, you know, understanding the market investor is uh, very important. And in this aspect, I think, come back to the role of the fund. I think uh, emerging market, yes, getting the classic right, policy right, financial market determining, Building research is very important. But there is a, uh, also a role of IMF in providing the global facility whereby if there is country in shock, then there is this is the role of the multilateral institution like the one that can provide. In the past, when I was in the IMF 2007, 2009, as executive director, I was introducing, we are, we are managing to introduce the flexible credit line. In this juncture, I think the fund need to issue more like the repo line of the center bank, what we call it, the swap like facility, which is you know readily for those emerging markets that have a good fundamental strong policy that you know can better withstand the global uh, shock. In, in addition, one in Indonesia we have a bilateral swap with China, Japan, Korea, and Australia and in uh, Southeast Asia and ASEAN Plus, we have a Chiang Mai PSG in our regional financial uh, region. I think this is this is where actually uh, co collaboration between country specific, regional initiative, and multilateral initiative can work together to have a better place for uh, emerging uh, markets. I'm going to turn it to questions from the audience shortly, but John, first of all, to ask you to respond to those, to those thoughts from the rest of the audience. Certainly, I think that's very, very constructive uh, suggestions. I think that the sort of discussion has been ongoing. It, it is bit of uh, um, you know, retail. We have been good friends for a long time. And one of the positions I'm responsible for is really uh, trying to keep that market defined, centered by corporations, which is really what our technical system is on a range of uh, central bank issues. And I think it's working very closely with the world. Should a flexible exchange rate be, um, which I think that was what Jason Kemp wanted to ask you. But, um, do you, in a sense, full, full floating perhaps can be an overstatement in terms of what's desirable. I'd be interested to get your sense on that. I mean, I think the, the FX rate obviously gets a lot of attention and focus, but it does need to be seen as um, partly an output of a country's overall policy goals because there, there may be a number of different issues uh, happening within the country and a number of government or authorities are, are trying to do at the same time. So um, I, think, I think broadly, as I mentioned before, a flexible exchange rate allows a sort of shock absorber for the country to, to allow uh, effectively the nominal economy to, to adjust to an external inflationary shock. Um, but there may be some very 
other reasons that you want to maintain a, a fit or, or at least a, a much more stable exchange rate as well. So I, I, I think one of the sort of themes that has come out of, of emerging market best practice over the last couple of years has been this notion that it's not a black or white answer anymore. That we obviously can't continue to fight market forces in a way that is unsustainable. And, but equally, we shouldn't just adopt a flexible exchange rate because that is what everyone seems to think of it. Change rate regimes, we should think about as, uh, that as part of the monetary policy framework in the sense that previously, you know, some, you know, a lot of countries had their exchange rate, and that was a very important nominal anchor, but then when we moved to a more flexible exchange rate, we have to have an alternative nominal anchor in the sense that if you well, it's, it's very strong market, so investors and market participants and institutions can plan what is the Just, to just, to just a couple of points on a very uh, interesting conversation on, on exchange rates. Um, the countries that we've seen that have been relatively more successful in implementing a credible exchange rate policy have targeted the, the volatility around the exchange rate, obviously, rather than a specific level. So any economy that has been subject to a speculative attack or a pronounced crisis has mistakenly targeted a particular um, countries like India, for example, or South Africa that have made a successful transition have just targeted the volatility around the exchange rate. So that would be one point that I would make. Um, but it certainly isn't uh, a, a black or white exercise of uh, exchange rates at all. Right, thank you. Let me uh, turn it over to the audience for questions. Um, please do uh, wait for the microphone and say uh, who you are and who the institution represent, and um, if you have a particular uh, panelist in mind for your question. Uh, at the front, right over there, right here, so the gentleman right here, Phil, please open the microphone. <coughs> Thank you very much. I'm Sander Moussisian from Armenia, founder of Leadership School. <coughs> My question is uh, to our panelists. I'd like to know, developing markets suffer from lack of clarity on exports and livelihood as companies from developing country, countries bring little into these markets. What uh, would be your advice uh, for increasing the variety of goods produced and goods available in the markets? Do you think that, uh, especially for the small uh, countries, uh, or developing, especially in developing countries, they should look uh, on technological development or technological directions only? Thank you. Thank you, and let me take uh, one more. Um, Thank you. Uh, Sarvan Nissan, executive project director in favor of Citizens Cyber Innovation and the Bank Fund Watchdog. I say that because I'm about to be a little bit rude. Um, um, so I actually feel great sympathy for you, just to be dumb as both just and dumb as both of you, um, because you're faced here with the hard and soft power of the Financial Times, think tanks, uh, Bretton Woods institutions, and of course the investor community. And I feel great sympathy for you because I think in some of the interventions from those four, and I, you, you mentioned as well that you were an executive director, um, I feel there are some really glaring absences. Um, in particular, some of the assumptions behind the descriptions. I don't really take issue with a lot of the uh, remarks, but I do want to ask both of you 
who uh, placed this uh, uh, table, um, <clears throat> what your views are on, for example, the use of financial management in terms of capital flows. Of course, the IMF created and agreed at great political and internal cost um, an institutional view on capital controls, which I would say very grudgingly accepted their legitimacy. Um, I think that we've seen, for example, strategies of well on the, um, the, the approaches that may not be so finance, financial services centric that can help grow your economy, for example, the Great Depression, as well as some of your remarks about diversification. Thank you very much. Two uh, excellent questions. Let, let's go straight to those. I'll um, divert both of those questions to the, de to the two deputy governors. Let me take the first one, which is uh, diversification, which uh, Deputy Governor, you were speaking about as well. What, what kind of measures can be uh, taken in order to diversify? Uh, economies. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I think it's the uh, policies that you have that incentivizes the uh, investors, both domestic and uh, foreign, to be able to go into other areas in the, uh, of the economy. We have had for a long time um, maybe was uh, not really focused on uh, uh, solid minerals. I was just talking about the water which is something commercially viable, solid minerals that we have. The fact that even food, food security is important. We can grow the food that we eat, but because uh, uh, for, for some reasons, policies haven't encouraged people to look inwards and grow their food, we tend to import. So the, the government will have to incentivize people to then diversify away from that main uh, commodity that we, that, um, that, that we, we rely on. Incentives are important. Policy consistency is important. And for you to encourage um, uh, 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 exports, for instance, you also need to incentivize people and make sure that they keep it, whatever they earn for the uh, commodities that they grow in what and the export, they earn the good that's where the exchange rate comes in again, but uh, I won't join issues with how flexible exchange rate will be. I guess, I mean, like, like the Deputy uh, Governor of Indonesia said, you have to look at the fundamentals of the economy, and it has to fit you into your visions of what you want the economy to be. Import substitution is another thing, which again has to do with diversification. When you produce things that you used to Uh, you know, uh, licenses, uh, 
put in central and local government. We are building a lot of our professional uh, training. So, so, so I think we are the country that able to have a leaders who find uh, away from uh, you know natural resource. I think it's uh, uh, very important. And we do not think that aging rate can be used to increase the competitiveness. I think down the line of the point, the aging rate policy only a part of our monetary policy. Indonesia has In the past, you know, the old uh, school of inflation targeting is a select actually to be flexible, whatever determined by the market. But as long as capital flows is manageable, that should be okay. That's the actually flexibility what we're talking about. But since the global crisis, we know that capital flows is very, you know, uh, very volatile. This huge inflow, huge outflow, and a lot of responding to a sentiment in the market. This is uh, where actually the misalignment will have a very negative impact to the economy. This is where actually the uh, intervention important, capital flows important, and the market, we have to have a friendly market. We are very close to the market. We know who is buying our government bond. Who is investor A, B, C, how much, what, how the price, what, what their behavior. That's why we meet, we, I have a teleconference every year. And everywhere I go, we are in New York, and New York and Mostly on the long-term investor to send our signal, to uh, explain our policy, and to get their feedback. What they want to see from Indonesia, making friend the market, the long-term market is very important in the policy making, as well as making friend with multilateral agencies like the IMF and the bank. I think the technical assistance from the the World Bank and the IMF, and we thank the World Bank for the uh, good technical assistance in the financial market as well as uh, IMF, you know, uh, I think it's a very, very, I think it is very uncertain what having more friends ready to adjust is very important. <laughs> Could you respond also to the critique on the IMF, uh, on the IMF policies and approaches? The, the, the second question on, on, on the IMF. Just perhaps, uh, forgive me, I'm going to have to leave in a minute, and it's really no reflection on any of you that I have a, a further reflection. Um, I would really like to hear your views on, because, you know, you, you talked about import substitution, on perhaps the specifics of managing the, the same topic the that, same, same that your the colleague uh, just mentioned about capital flows and the interrelationship between your policies and how you manage that, those pressures on your exchange rate, the mix of policies that you have to always keep in place, spinning in the air, no doubt. Well, well, I, I I believe that uh, now that IMF is becoming a bit softer on that uh, issue, we... Oh, I understand that better. <laughs> 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 we don't have to... You know what I'm that, so you <laughs> Because uh, capital, uh, capital control has always been an issue with IMF, but somehow, I think they have, they have a, a, a no, new world they use is. for it now that, uh, you know, somehow you could manage it when it's it's, uh, we, we, we have also gone through that before the recent uh, financial shock when we had a lot of uh, capital coming in and there were some measures we put in place in Nigeria like uh, saying that you could not uh, invest in some very short term because we, we thought if the money comes into the country you should be able to do something rather than just coming on a Monday and leave on Wednesday or by Friday the money is gone just because you want to take advantage and I think uh, now we are beginning to understand each other a bit that some of these things can be put in place. Right now, we are not, uh, now that we have capital flow reversal, it's, uh, it's on a different side. But I'm sure we'll get there again. And we, we normally have uh, lively discussions with mm -hmm. that. <laughs> Since you have to leave, uh, I think what, what I can say is that, you know, the multilateral institutions, this fund certainly where I work, you know, we are, all, we are for an open global economic system. So we think that uh, the uh, integrated economies, global trade and, and financial integration are uh, beneficial in the longer term. 
political economy. So certainly, we, we want to call on you know, our membership uh, to fight against trade and financial protectionism. And you know, we are at a critical juncture, as you mentioned, there are some political risks that we need to manage. We don't want to see a major setback uh, to uh, global economic integration. That's, having said that, we also uh, recognize, for example, in the case of financial integration, in the institutional view we have just managed, that was a historical milestone for the membership to come up or to agree on, on, on a very nuanced view as to what is the appropriate step we should take in terms of financial integration or liberalization. And uh, for the, uh, 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 the ultimate uh, the, the, the advanced economies, so certainly we believe uh, that uh, you know, uh, for all membership, actually, macroeconomic framework, a sound macroeconomic framework uh, should be there. measures, uh, but for countries that have not liberalized, we also make a very clear statement. There is no uh, uh, requirement uh, or no uh, stipulation that countries should liberalize uh, or should go for liberalization at any time. Uh, and it has to be country-specific and depends on the degree of sophistication of the financial system, and they have to make the judgment. And also, under certain circumstances, already liberalized their, their financial accounts, they can resort to countries for management measures to safeguard financial stability. So these are the you know, very nuanced positions country authorities can take. But more broadly, we are for very open global trade and financial system. Daniel and Phyllis, can I ask you to respond on those points? Um, thank you. I, actually, I, I might shift it a little bit. I think there's been some very good comments on the sort of financial pledge, but I, coming back to the question real economy flows. And I think the importance of trying to encourage inward investment into a country, uh, and some of the same themes are there, I think are also very important, but constant communication and predictability to sort of real economy uh, inward investors to encourage FDI, I think plays a very, very important role. Um, and I think countries that broadly have uh, sort of low doing business, um, or rather high doing business survey results, i.e. it's a pretty conducive business environment, relatively predictable, tend to attract And I think one of the big sort of global challenges at the moment about emerging markets growth more broadly is, is around infrastructure. And I think building critical infrastructure, whether that's power, whether that's telecommunications, um, are going to be the next sort of big things we need to solve to unlock the next wave of growth. Um, and there I think it's, it's all about how do we get those long-term investors really incentivized and focused on, on doing that. Because the money is sitting there, it just needs to be structured in a way that it's attractive. Yes, I think I would pick up on that point that inward investment is usually fostered in economies which have their financial house um, in order. And I think that it's worth making a distinction between real economic flows and, and financial flows in particular countries. Um, if we take a country, a systemically important country like China, for example, uh, its liberalization, its devaluation in 2015 caused quite a bit of volatility in the financial markets and with its trading partners. But that again needed to be and needs to be accompanied by financial market weakening and debt reduction as they liberalize into the global economy. So for many of these countries, there really is a balancing act involved in the economic and, and the financial. Thanks. Um, we have a question now um, right here, please. Yep. Thanks very much. You could be from uh, Standard Charter. Uh, I was actually quite curious on what you said, Pat Perry, on, on the, the flexible credit line and the FCL. Um, I mean, I was actually at the IMF at a time and um, part of the working group that did that. And I think that there was quite high hopes on that becoming like a, a mainstream instrument for, for countries. But there's only been three countries that ever, uh, so Colombia, Poland, and Mexico, who ever, ever picked up on that. So I guess my question is that, um, you know, what do you think are the impediments in general and, and perhaps in Indonesia in particular? I mean, is it the, the stigma that's still attached to that or or perhaps that, you know, people don't really know who qualifies for, for, for the FDL, but maybe that's what John Hay more than uh, the other comments. Thanks. Um, one more right here, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Derek Bell from the OEI. Um, so 
we discuss uh, sort of solutions to financial risks and financial crises, uh, thinking about real economy solutions and financial uh, solutions. So think about financial deepening is an answer, and we've heard about uh, diversification. Um, and I suppose we, can, we should hear even more from Indonesia, I think, how we managed to get out of this crisis in the 90s, uh, because we had diversified away from a metal resource dependent economy to manufacturing, for example, uh, successfully attracting investment in it. And I think that's exactly uh, a point where maybe Nigeria might be at this particular juncture. We do need to uh, think about diversification, as you said, in your own words, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Allen. Um, but thinking about bringing them together, so think about finance solutions and real economy solutions. If the priority now is to diversify, so we, we need to think about uh, diversifying into manufacturing <coughs> and into other, other sectors, how can you make sure that more finance is flowing into the real eco economy? What are, what are the practical steps that can be taken? Yes, it could be attracting investment, but is there other, other steps that central banks can uh, play so that there's more uh, finance going into the real economy, so that it doesn't go only to the real estate sector, and that, that, that the commercial banks don't only lend to the, uh, to the, uh, the governments uh, uh, in the African countries, for example, uh, but that actually that, that commercial funds, uh, that other funding is more, perhaps it's much more towards that, the diversification of economies, the real sector, uh, so that both the, the financial solutions and the real economy solutions can work together uh, to, to address uh, the stresses of the country. Okay, so uh, if you go to first of all, can I ask you on the SEL and the, the, the question of whether, why is the need more, what, what's, what's your own experience, um, understanding of this issue? Uh, specifically, uh, you know, uh, Asia, uh, you know, and, uh, and a number of countries in Asia, including in Indonesia and Thailand, South Korea, and so on, that uh, uh, quote unquote bad memory or set more issues towards the MF of the, uh, you know, uh, our engagement in that was the IMF back then. I mean, uh, IMF now is uh, changing us. Uh, on the swap, on the facilitating that we are looking for, uh, the FTL is still a borrowed. As long as a borrowed, then there is like, you know, urgency problem. And the urgency problem, that's the stigma issues. So I think this is a, this is a real uh, problem of the engagement. Uh, what we need is the soft life facilitator. Like the central bank, they're offering the, uh, the normal monetary operation repo and those kind of things. Uh, where country is this uh, as good as uh, Indonesia and other country in the region? I think this is this is the facility that, 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 that we need, you know, uh, not, you know, quote unquote, fight on the board. And secondly, is this facility. It is a, a meet, you know, the criteria of sound policy, a fundamental, a good track record, and, and so on. Just like you know, the central bank is offering, you know, uh, day to day repo facility to uh, sound banks and, 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 and so on. Uh, and I think this this kind of the, the, the facility that, 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 that should they have. This is, this is where actually the FCL, as we know it, I think still, you know, uh, inherited. The issue of uh, borrowing, uh, agency problem, this kind of uh, thing. This is the, the we are we are from the from the from the Asia. I think we're voicing uh, for the IMF to consider. And thanks uh, now the, there is a, a study, there is a, a discussion. As I know, the, uh, Dom, I think it's discussion underway that now the IMF are looking this kind of uh, uh, issue. I think I think this is what we are. Sector, you know, can be a wedge or can be, you know, a transmitter of the financial flow to the real uh, flows. In the real sector, getting the infrastructure right, investment climate, open policy for foreign direct investment, you know, those kind of uh, things. On the financial uh, sector, we need to develop financing that can be, uh, you know, used to finance the, uh, the economy, whether we're talking about stock corporate bond, infrastructure bond, and so on, on the longer term promissory note, uh, medium term, on the short term, the repo facility, providing the liquidity, on those aspects that can be, you know, uh, transmitting the, the, the financial flow to uh, the uh, real economy flow. On the financial flow, as I said, there is long term investor, real investor, there is hedge fund type, the 
the thought from the speaker at the time. They, they, he, he had to the flexibility of the policy of the country's people. For the long term, we don't know. They are lacking stability. They have more uncertainty, uh, good sound policy, communication. I think what, what uh, you know, uh, Daniel is talking about. This is a real uh, uh, term investor. But short term investor, they are liking the writing the way. You know, they, uh, as a busy, uh, busy thing of the military is like, uh, coming on Monday, leaving on Friday, because they are writing the way. The, so uh, the stability of the country is, uh, you know, uh, I think it's also, uh, you know, uh, the thing that we need to put in place so the country can respond better to this kind of short-term speculative goods. Okay, uh, if you want to respond on that on that same point, the speculative flows and getting money into the real economy, not the financial. I, I want to uh, concentrate especially on the banking uh, system. Why they will rather not run to, to the rate set I think uh, probably the problem is that the rate set for sometimes in the emerging countries are not attractive. You have to, if you're going into manufacturing, you have to provide your own light, your own road, your own water, and you know many other infrastructural needs that you do need. So to be able to get the banks to do what is macroeconomic stability, the fiscal authorities, government will have to borrow less from the banks so that they can concentrate on their implementation needs. As long as Banks have an opportunity of lending money to government at very high interest rates. They will not be targeted with uh, the rates of law. So, but once government starts having support with or reducing the borrowing, then they will have to do um, to, to do that. So we also have to, you know, as central bank, we also we, 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 we use moral suspicion to say lend to those people. So if we have the infrastructure ready, like. You have industrial estates where they don't have to provide anything, they just sort of go in and they can manufacture their goods. This encourages banks to also want to uh, key in into those kind of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of areas. So the money, the, the, the funds they have, can then flow to the rate sector uh, economy. So we have uh, uh, a lot of things for the government to do, a lot of things for the banks as well. You can also, we also try to promote competition in the bank so that they are not all focused on government. You do have some smaller, in, in, in Nigeria, we do have uh, smaller banks. Apart from microfinance banks, we have regional banks that are not looking at the blue chip. They are looking at, uh, you know, trade within the manufacturing sphere so that they can then do. And so there are a lot of things that the, the government will have to do apart from providing um, uh, maybe subsidized interest rates to, to, the, to the manufacturers so that they can also look at that side. Okay. Uh, John Kleist, could you ask on, uh, respond on the uh, FCL and those issues? Um, I'm not really working with other funds in FCL dealing with these facilities, but uh, I think I can echo uh, Professor John McCarrick's point that these issues are being tackled in the discussion. So I, I'm not really in The importance of diversification uh, into the real economy is an interesting one to as well. But it's a real estate or whatever it might be. Um, you know, the developmental process is very, very difficult. Uh, that we know throughout the world, uh, in, you know, the history, certain countries have moved faster than others. Uh, you know, some countries like China, India, uh, they have also accumulated a lot of experience in attracting certain types of flow. In the end, I think it's the policy framework uh, that matters. I don't know at what level you can really micromanage in directing these flows into certain industries. Uh, that is, uh, that is, I think, less, uh, there's less consensus on that one. I think there's more consensus that, uh, as both uh, colleagues from the central bank mentioned, this broader policy framework, uh, and for example, macro, policy framework, particularly fiscal policy, that is in, in order, uh, and then you know, banking systems can do their job. Uh, and you know, if you have some of the basic uh, macro frameworks in place, that will make life of foreign 
long-term investors, foreign investors, direct investors, to make their lives much easier. Uh, and uh, and uh, other than that, I think it's really hard to tell uh, you know, which specific schemes can use the direct flows in different sectors. Uh, how do you encourage long-term flows and short runs? These are these are much more difficult issues. So I cannot uh, say more than that. I'm, I'm going to turn it um, both to Daniel and Phyllis. And, um, after responding on these two points to the extent you wish to, could um, we now move to a, maybe a final uh, thought, a wrapping up thought from each of you, and I'll then take it to the other panelists. Uh, just what your main takeaway is for, from this session. Um, first, Daniel. Um, I think an incredibly rich and uh, useful conversation uh, around, I, I think, the, the various perspectives of, of how countries are adapting to mentoring the Foxconn world. Um, and also, I, I think the, the importance of um, both having a, a sort of very proactive and flexible uh, approach to these sorts of things. Um, I think it's very hard to kind of come up with one summation of these points. But one thing I, I would talk about, I think, is during a shock, um, I think you have two aspects going on at the moment for investors and others trying to work out what's happening. I think you actually have the risk of what is going to happen. So both the probability and the impact of and then I think you have the perception of that risk. And I think for, for really solving this, I think particularly for countries where there are there is a plan being put in place or that there are good fundamentals, and, and maybe that shock has just overlooked that point at the moment, I think there is, is great scope for both the private sector and the public sector to come together to really um, adjust, uh, to help countries adjust to that perception of risk again. And, and I think the FCL discussion I think is, is a very interesting one because I think a lot of services that can be part of it. I mentioned the role that the World Bank RBA took in, in supporting Ghana to do an issuance dur during its transition. Um, I think there are a number of other uh, sort of work streams going on in the multilaterals and also among the development community um, on this. For example, there's a, a sort of European development organization called Frontra that is looking at providing market access uh, during periods of stress or where there is no market liquidity to hedging instruments. And I think this combination of, of where the private sector and the public sectors together uh, to really facilitate uh, a country uh, coming through a period or a shock. Um, I think that, that's something that we should see in terms of more funding. Thanks very much. Uh, and thank you for a very rich conversation, as you said. Um, from the work we've done at ODI, we know the role of finance or the lack thereof is very important for manufacturing sectors. So that's clearly an area where it's of key importance to look at how Actually, the macroeconomics is quite an important condition to manufacture and then get moved in a lot of these uh, emerging and developing countries. Um, more broadly, I think there's something to be said for increased global governance. I think particularly <coughs> the, um, the presence of finance led globalization, you have a lack of global governance, and particularly the dialogue between the private and the public sectors as well. Um, so, I think given the fact that even high frequency trading in financial markets now accounts for almost 50% of the currency market. That dialogue between the private sector and the public sector governance is one that should be quite important. Thanks, Doc. Um, I've been given a five minute warning, so that gives um, a little over a minute each for the last three panelists just to give a final reflection um, on what you would be taking away from the discussions we've been having on shocks uh, facing emerging markets. I think this is a very unprecedented global environment, uh, particularly uh, in the last economic year. We have seen probably a fairly long period of low growth and low interest rates. And global growth will continue to be driven by emerging markets and developing countries. Uh, but it doesn't create a very uh, easy financial environment for these countries, given that advanced economies currencies are still dominant in shaping global financial conditions. Uh, so it's going to be a difficult period. Uh, but as long as uh, emerging markets uh, have a very clear understanding of the, of the risks, and they have also uh, policy instruments uh, at their dis disposal, and they build up uh, resilience, both public governments and financial governments, I think they will be able to navigate to grow and, and, uh, and uh, improve the welfare of their citizens. I think that uh, more broadly, I think we should still be able to say that we should be reasonably optimistic that emerging markets and developing countries uh, will be 
Second, ready to adjust and adapt. I think this is a very important uh, adjustment in macroeconomy, adjustment in the real sector, financial market is very important. It's conditional. We need uh, to be uh, adaptable, of course, and the answer is with this financial stability, uh, crisis prevention, uh, education, uh, education research, I think it's uh, very important. This is the thing that we learned uh, since the global crisis and crisis prevention in Indonesia, I think is a, a much wide one, one of the best performer of the emerging uh, economy that uh, we have. And I think this is also a result of making a good balance of the money, of the real sector, and also the role of the financial and global bank. I think this is continuous engagement is a, a very important, uh, I think, uh, where the multilateral institution like uh, the, the fund, the FSB, and facilitate uh, I'm talking about but I think this also can also uh, enhance the resilience of emerging uh, countries that we see in Asia and speak uh, uh, to different sectors. Thank you. I think um, macroeconomic stability is important in very short financial short if um, I mean unless you have Communication is also, is also very important. You have to keep communicating what will work, what you have in play, and uh, allow investors and the market to see the kind of um, policies that you have and why you are taking the decision. And finally, again, I would emphasize diversification. It is important for stable uh, management, for reserves. Thanks, and thanks for me, uh, from me as well. Uh, this has been a terrific conversation. Uh, I've really enjoyed it and learned a lot uh, from listening to our excellent uh, panelists. Uh, a really broad range of topics ranging from protectionism to foreign exchange reserve management to uh, monetary policy, macro prudential policy, FCLs, and everything in between. As someone who covers uh, the, uh, the US election at the moment, I certainly can think the theme of, of shocks and, uh, and volatility is an appropriate one. So uh, with that um, echoing in everyone's head, uh, looking towards November here and the global ramifications of the, the election uh, in the US, um, thank you everyone for joining us and please join me in thanking our panelists.